a religious fanatic, attacks an important American military institution, causing a hostage situation that paves the way towards civil war. Now that should be a movie. John Brown's body lies a molding in the grave. John Brown's body lies a molding in the grave. John Brown's body lies a molding in the grave. What else do you expect it to do? I'm sorry. Hello, and thank you for watching today's episode of That Should Be a Movie. I'm C.W. Johnson Jr. Today's book I like to pitch as a movie is Midnight Rising, John Brown and the Raid that Sparked the Civil War, by Tony Horwitz from Henry Holt and Company. Almost every school child knows, or used to know, that the raid led by the radical abolitionist John Brown on the Army Arsenal at Harper's Ferry was a stepping stone towards the American Civil War. Less widely known are the hidden details of this political act of terrorism. There is much more to the story than just a failed attempt to ignite a sway rebellion. There could be a focus on Brown's backstory and family life. He came from a strict religious background and was so consumed in his fight against slavery that he often neglected his wife in poverty and drove some of his children to have nervous breakdowns. Considering his use of broadswords to massacre pro-slavery settlers in Kansas, the state of his mental sanity could be explored. One romantic angle could be that of John Brown's last surviving daughter, Annie, who was 16 at the time of the raid, and, according to family lore, was in love with one of the raiders. Another romantic interest story would be that of Aaron Stevens and Jenny Dunbar. Jenny seems to have ignored Aaron's letters until she heard that he had been sentenced to be hung. Then she finally visited him in jail. Other romantic relationships did or might have developed between the other raiders and the families who were giving them aid and shelter. One particularly interesting relationship to explore would be that of Hayward Seppert and Fontaine Beckham. Seppert was a free person of color and a railroad porter. Even though he was free, he needed white sponsorship to freely travel and work in the county. Beckham, the mayor of Harper's Ferry, provided him guardianship. In one of the great ironies of history, Seppert was the first person sought by the raiders seeking the free African-American slaves. He was shot in the back while fleeing from the raiders. He lingered for 12 hours before he died. His death so enraged Beckham that he himself attacked the armory and was killed. This sent the citizens of Harper's Ferry into a fury. Another interesting character is Dangerfield Nubai. Older than most of the raiders, he was a freedman who had saved $700 to buy his wife's freedom. When her owner changed his mind about selling her the hymn, Nubai joined the raid in which he was one of the first to die. He has been referred to as the real Django Unchained. Unfortunately, after his death, his money was divided among his relatives and his wife sold down the river. John Brown's raid could make a great action film that explores the limits and consequences of political violence. Horowitz says that the Harper's Ferry can be seen as an Al-Qaeda prequel. A long-bearded fundamentalist consumed by hatred to the U.S. government launches 19 men in a suicide strike on a symbol of American power. A sock nation plunges into war. We are still grappling with the consequences. I know that the American Film Company, a company dedicated to making movies about American history, has proposed making a movie about the raid. I greatly applaud their efforts. If you haven't seen their previous movies, The Conspirator, Parkland, and Against the Sun, you should check them out. Because it is an important and exciting event in American history, full of human drama, I believe that Midnight Rising by Tony Horwitz should be a movie. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe, and let me know in the comment section what book about American history you think would make a great movie.